Okay, well look, what I am not going to do is I am in um, very much better informed uh, company on these questions uh, than I am. I'm not going to talk specifically um, about uh, war and disability because that's going to be dealt with uh, later on um, in the day by more expert people. Um, and I think the intention is that I sort of provide a kind of broad context for understanding what actually happens between 1914 and 18, and then more generally, the nature of modern industrialised um, warfare. So I want to sort of set the scene really for uh, the discussion about um, what is going on from 1914 onwards and specifically what it is we are thinking about in this um, centenary um, year. Is that what I put? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to deal quickly first of all with um, arguments which I'm sure are familiar to everybody here already but I'm going to summarise quite quickly what needs to be said about the way in which there is uh, currently in society an attempt to reinterpret um, the First World War and to change the way in which we collectively as a society think about this experience, to, to shift the paradigm, if you like, to shift the way um, that ordinary people think about the First World War. And it involves, it involves broadcasters um, like Jeremy Paxman, who we suddenly discover this year is an expert um, on the First World War and has given uh, a four-part documentary series, or a three-part documentary series to explain it all to us. Um, we all know that um, uh, Gove, who is, was, um, he's no longer a leading member of the uh, government, um, possibly the most odious uh, member of the uh, regime that's been in power since 2010, Gove was leading uh, the attack. Uh, really, on the traditional interpretations of the First World War. Um, Max Hastings is possibly the most high profile of a raft of uh, right wing revisionist historians who've been trying to persuade us that the First World War is part of um, a normal world, a rational world, the kind of thing you have to do. Um, and of course, Cameron, uh, although he's not um, fronted this, he's basically promoting. Um, uh, a whole series of celebrations, sometimes they use that word, certainly a whole series of commemorations of the First World War um, in a way that is designed to put the focus on things like military glory, military victory, heroism, and so on and so forth. So there is a serious um, attempt to reconfigure the way in which we think um, about the First World War, specifically and more generally modern industrialised warfare. Now, I want to, I'm going to deal with uh, three basic arguments uh, very quickly because I'm, I'm going to assume that most people are on the same page um, in this respect. One of the things they argue is that Germany was particularly unpleasant in 1914 as an imperial power. Um, there's a particular focus, for example, on the atrocities which were committed by German troops as they went into Belgium in 1914 was featured in the black propaganda of the time, but has also been uh, given a high profile um, uh, recently in the discussions this year. Now, it is true that the Germans killed 6,000 people uh, when they went into uh, Belgium. That's well supported by the historical evidence. What they don't talk about, of course, is all of the other atrocities which were being committed by the imperial powers, the other imperial powers in the run-up to the war, and then in the course of the war. I give you just one example. Um, the uh, colonial ruling class that ran poor little Belgium was chopping off the hands of children in the Congo when they failed to meet their uh, rubber quotas. So if we want to talk about um, atrocities, then let us talk about atrocities in an even-handed way and lay the blame uh, on imperialism generally and not specifically on one particular imperial power. Another argument that has been revived is that this was in some sense a, uh, a, a war between uh, democratic Britain and democratic France and a more autocratic, uh, a Prussian uh, type uh, dominated uh, Germany. That argument is also uh, bogus. British and the French were in alliance with Tsarist Russia, which was probably the most ruthless despotism in Europe um, at the time. Germany, in fact, had universal manhood uh, suffrage at the time when Britain did not. 40% of men in Britain didn't have the vote in 1914. And of course, 
uh, the Liberal government in Britain was waging war against the suffragette movement in, in an attempt to deny uh, women uh, the vote. So if you were a suffragette, indeed, if you were a, uh, any kind um, of woman in Britain at the time, the real enemy was the Liberal government, not the Kaiser, because it was the Liberal government that was denying women the vote. So the whole idea that this was in some sense a war for democracy is nonsense. And if it's about imperialism, and Germany was accused at the time and has been accused by the revisionists um, this year of being a particularly imperialistic, aggressive, expansionist power, well, let's just remind ourselves of a very straightforward fact that the biggest empire in the world at the time was the British Empire, the second biggest empire in the world at the time was the French Empire, and the German Empire, the overseas empire, was relatively small by comparison. None of these arguments, none of these arguments should be taken um, seriously. I want to talk a little bit uh, in a moment about the nature um, of this conflict between 1914 and 1918, but I want to put it into a slightly wider context, um, first of all. I want to talk just a little bit, just briefly, about the history of war in a very general sense, because I want to underline how there is a qualitative shift in 1914 in the nature of warfare, and that we have lived in the last hundred years in an epoch where the nature of warfare is radically different in a way which makes it a much, much more terrible um, experience for the people who are um, the victims of it. So this is a, a very, very brief potted history of war in three parts, really. I just want to make essentially three points. The first is that war is rooted in the division of the world into states, into rival states. They might be city-states, they might be tribally based states, they might be empires, they might be kingdoms, they might be modern nation states, but it's rooted in the fact that you have a division of the world into rival states and rival states that are themselves internally divided between different social classes, such that within these individual states you have wealthy people, powerful people, who require armed forces, both to keep down the subject population inside their own territories, but also to defend the territories that they control against their rivals beyond their borders. So war is inextricably associated with the rise of the state and a world which is divided in terms of classes and divided in terms um, of territory. So it goes right the way back really to the beginning of in inverted commas, um, civilization. I use that word somewhat um, cautiously. You know, you know what Gandhi said about, um, when Gandhi was asked, um, I always use this when I talk about civilization, this is my caveat talking about civilization. Gandhi was famously asked um, uh, what he thought of Western civilization. And he's supposed to have paused for a minute and then said, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> and um, uh, that really sort of sums it up. Let's use the word civilization to mean complex society. For the sort of 5,000 years that complex societies um, have um, existed, we've had warfare. So I use this example of um, a very, very ancient art object that dates from 2500 BC, comes from Mesopotamia, and it depicts an army, an army engaged in actually an imperialist war because you can see the victims underneath the horses um, hooves and there's another part of it which shows the, uh, the procession of prisoners. Then secondly, um, I think uh, war changes character quite radically with what we sometimes describe as the bourgeois revolution, the 16th, 17th, 18th century transformation of the world where you get the shift towards the development of, of capitalism, of commercial capitalism and uh, an imperialism that, that is linked with the development of co commercial capitalism, then what happens is that you get a shift to a kind of warfare where armies become machine-like, in that what you're trying to do is you're trying to group together large numbers of men, it's invariably uh, men, you are drilling them intensively so that they move and they deliver fire on the battlefield in a machine-like way. So it's, it's almost turning the process 
of waging war into something that is akin to the way in which production is turned into a factory system, is turned into mass production with the development of, uh, of, of, of capitalism. War becomes machine-like, just as production becomes a machine-like uh, process with the development um, of capitalism in the wake of the bourgeois revolution. And then, this is my sort of third stage, really, and this is now bringing us up to the centenary that I want to focus on. Um, there's, a, there's a third shift um, in the development of, of warfare that comes about with the Industrial uh, Revolution, the Industrial Revolution beginning in the late 18th century, taking off in certain parts of the world during the 19th century. And I think by 1914, for the first time, becoming the basis on which uh, conflict is waged. It's the Industrial Revolution is a process, a gradual process of industrialization, increasing technological sophistication, increasing levels of mass production. It's only with 1914 that you get a decisive shift to a new way of war that is based upon mass production, such that there is an endless stream of supplies, of uniforms, of guns, of ammunition, of materiel, to the front lines, so that states are able to put into the field and sustain in the field armies that number not now tens of thousands, not even hundreds of thousands, but millions strong, millions strong being fed, millions strong with the uniforms they need, millions strong being supplied uh, with guns, such that you get a war of attrition. And you get um, war becoming a process of industrialised destruction. That's the third great shift, really, in the history um, of war, and it's what we want to uh, focus on now a little bit more as we get a handle on how we should think about the nature of modern warfare in a general sense. So I'm now focusing very much on war from 1914 um, onwards. And I want to suggest that there are sort of three levels, really, where or three dimensions to a, a proper understanding of modern warfare. One is that these are wars of imperialism. They are wars that arise because the world um, is not just divided now into nation states, it's also a world that is divided into empires, either in the literal sense that you have the more powerful wealthy states in direct control of other, other people's countries, other territory or in the looser sense that you have spheres of influence, spheres of economic uh, influence. So you have kind of informal empire. It's more informal empire today. In 1914, um, empire took the form of direct imperial rule by the imperial powers. The, uh, I put up a, just an image, a contemporary image from the late 19th uh, century that makes the point well enough. The, the scramble for Africa is, of course, a symbol of the development of this uh, empire and direct control over foreign uh, territory with sort of 90% of Africa by the end of the 19th century under the control of one or other of the imperial powers. And what's happening in the late 19th and the early 20th century as the capitalist economies of Europe explode in terms of productivity, in terms of output, is there's a desperate scramble to grab the territories overseas where they have the raw materials, where they have the markets, where they have the places where they can invest the surplus capital that's being generated by the booming um, system. And then, once the spheres of influence have been created, you get that imperialist tension reacting back on what is happening inside Europe. And Germany is the focus of it. Germany is the focus of it because Germany is late to unify and late to industrialize. So that as the Germans begin to attempt to build empire, they find that most of the rest of the world, most of the opportunities have already been seized and occupied by the British and the French in particular. And that gives rise to the tension. And with 90% of Africa carved up, 
the tension then builds up inside um, Europe, and you get a militarization of the relations between the great powers um, inside Europe. It's, it's sort of encapsulated by this contemporary cartoon, uh, which dates to, as you can see, 1914, and it's talking about the way in which Europe is becoming so incredibly tense uh, in this period. There is an arms race that is taking off um, in the last sort of 20 years or so before the outbreak um, of the First World War. That's the tensions, of it, the tensions of expanding capitalism, the tensions of imperialism, then being reflected in what is happening in terms of the relationships between the rival states inside Europe and in terms of an arms race. And so I make, I, I make no apologies for saying um, that we cannot understand modern warfare without the insights of this um, great group, because it wasn't just Lenin, there was a group of people, a group of Marxist intellectuals, revolutionary socialist uh, political activists and leaders in the late 19th and the early part of the 20th century who were developing a theory of imperialism, developing an understanding of what it was about the world that meant that you had this competition for empire, you had this rising tension between the nation states of Europe, you had this militarization of the way in which international relations were being conducted. We need that theory of imperialism, and although we need to update it, although we need to apply it to the way in which imperialism has developed in, in, in the period since, it is the starting point for any serious of un understanding of modern, industrialized um, warfare. That's one dimension um, to our understanding of war, that war is imperialist war. My second observation about it is, uh, is that it is also industrialized. That the empire, the great, the great empires in antiquity, there have been great empires throughout history, throughout the history of class society, there have been empires for 5,000 years. What's different about empires today is that their power is underwritten by industries. There's no such thing as a non-industrial empire nowadays. All of the great imperial powers of the last hundred years and longer have been powers that have been uh, where the bulk of their strength, the bulk of their wealth has come from the development of industry. And for the first time between 1914 and 1918, you get the industrialization of killing. You get killing turned into an industrial process. He would talk about this in relation to the Holocaust, uh, which Richard referred to, of course, um, in, in introducing. He would talk about the way in which, uh, in the Nazi Holocaust, they industrialized the process of destroying life, and that's absolutely correct. They also industrialized the process of killing on the battlefield. They make systematic the destruction um, of, of, of human life, and, and they pump huge industrialized resources um, into it with the most um, appalling consequences, not just in destroying uh, human life, but in tearing bodies apart by filling space with fragments of red-hot flying um, metal. I mean, it's, it, it's an extraordinary kind of inversion of the creativity, the ingenuity, the industry of humanity, that all of these great achievements, these, this great potential that we have as a civilization, a potential uh, civilization, gets turned into this monstrous uh, mechanism of uh, destruction. And so when I try and get a handle on it, um, I have recourse to Marx, and the way in which Marx talks about, he uses this expression, he, it's usually translated, of course he writes in German, of course, but it's usually translated as reification, which sort of means thinness. And it's the idea that, that social relationships and social capacities, so our capacity through working together to produce the wealth that we need to make our lives better, that gets turned into a monstrous mechanism that dominates our lives that we've lost control of. And he uses the term reification to describe what's happening in industry, but it, it is it also equally applicable to what is happening in war. What's happening in war is we, humanity, are losing control 
of the things that we are creating. And you have this, you have, and you have contradictions like this, absurdities like this. In the shell factories, they are employing women. So women go into the shell factories in Britain and produce the munitions that are then sent to the front and fired at the German trenches to blow apart German boys. And in Germany, there are women who've gone into the shell factories to produce the shells that are supplied to the front to send into the British trenches to blow apart British boys. So you have women constructing the machines that are destroying uh, their menfolk at the front line. That's reification. That is madness. That is a situation where um, we've got human beings employing all of that intelligence, all of that creativity, and so on, to create things that are destroying um, uh, their loved ones. Reification is this second sort of key concept, I think, to, that we need to really get a handle on the nature of modern industrialised warfare. Here's um, a third idea that I think is useful. And I, I sometimes, when, when, when I'm speaking to a, a left-wing um, audience, I'm, I'm sometimes a little bit hesitant about using the F word, uh, which is Freud, um, <laughs> because Freud is very, very controversial, um, uh, in, uh, generally, I mean, left-wing circles not least. But actually, I do think we need to have an understanding of what is happening inside people's heads. I think we do need a theory where alienation is internalised, and how is it internalised? And I think if you read a lot of the contemporary material that comes out of the war, if you read the poetry, if you read the, uh, the memoirs and the novels, um, if you look at the artworks, um, this is um, one of a series of images produced by Otto Dietz, um, who was a German uh, trench fighter, and uh, he was then a radical in the post-war period, radicalised by the experience of the war, one of the leading German, radical German artists of the post-war period. He produced this series of images. And what is he depicting? He's depicting something mad. He's depicting uh, a world that has ceased to have anything human or humane uh, about it. He's depicting, in a sense, a world gone mad. And there are other German artists also overwhelmed by this sense that the world has gone mad. This is um, another artist uh, of the time um, called uh, Grosch. And what Grosch is doing here is he's depicting the rage of the German bourgeois, the German middle class, the German jingo uh, that is supporting the war effort. And he's saying, what's going on? What's going on? in the heads of these people. He's posing this question that is making them behave um, in this way. We need to understand what is happening in terms of psychology, mass psychology. We need to understand the way in which libido, which is the life force in our heads, the striving for connection, the striving towards uh, cooperation and uh, bonding, the, the force that enables us to work uh, together in a supportive and cooperative way, the way in which that is dammed up, and by being dammed up, can be transformed into, into mass psychotic rage. Because it is mass psychotic rage that they mobilise, our rulers mobilise, when they send people uh, onto a battlefield. It's a mass psychotic rage that they mobilise. Uh, when they organise people to carry out um, acts of genocide and so on. We need to understand the nature of modern industrialised war um, at a psychological level, as well as at the level of industry um, and in terms of, it, um, terms of imperialism. My point then is that there is a new paradigm of war which emerges in 1914 and has shaped the experience of warfare um, in the century since. Um, it's about imperialism, where you get um, a fusion of uh, traditional political conflict, political competition between different states, with the economic competition of banks and big corporations for control of markets, control of raw materials and so on. A fusion of those two forms of competition creates imperialism. 
It's about reification. It's about the way in which industrial power, which is created by humanity, is turned into a force for the destruction of life and the destruction of wealth. It's about repression and the way in which um, our instincts, our life force, our libido is dammed up, distorted, transformed by repression into a kind of psychotic rage which is then unleashed in war and unleashed in atrocities and unleashed in genocide. It's about this creating something on a scale which is without historic parallel. So the First World War kills about 15 million people and as Richard was uh, pointing out in the introduction we have to multiply that by three to get a sense of the human devastation because for every one killed there are another three who are permanently damaged in mind or in body. And then because it comes 20 years later and the firepower is that much greater, the industrial power is that much greater, the, first, the, the, the Second World War kills 60 million. And again, we must multiply this to get the full sense of the, of, of the scale of it. And it's been estimated, who knows how accurate this figure is, it's one estimate. It's been estimated that between 1914 and, and, and 2014, something like 160 million people have been killed in war, which implies that there are 500, 600 million people whose lives have been torn apart in one way or another by war over the last um, century. What is modern industrialized war? This is uh, an image from Deeks, produced by Deeks again. What is um, modern industrialized war? What does the First World War represent? It represents by any measure, any rational measure, um, a world gone mad. And fin my, my, my final criticism, my, my ultimate criticism, my central criticism of the revisionists is a terrible failure of historical imagination, a terrible inability that they have to step back and view this phenomenon as an explosion um, of, uh, of madness, because that's quite clearly um, what it is. A world gone mad um, is what is represented by a century of industrialized war, and it continues. Have some discussion. Yeah. So I'm going to open it up to the floor for any um, thoughts or questions you may wish to put to me. Don't be shy. I'll, I'll start with one then, because I'm going to talk a bit uh, this afternoon about the impact of war on the majority world rather than the European powers, but if you've started that discussion. Yeah. Um, what what do you think, since the Second World War, it seems that all of our wars, with perhaps the exception of the Israel-Palestine struggle and Serbia and, and then, but all of the other wars that have gone on, that something like 230 since the Second World War, have been fought out on the, what would be the periphery of the world capitalist system rather than at the core. Uh, do you think that is linked to your analysis that, if you like, the, the powers that be in, in the heartland states, which, which run the world system, thought, well, we can't have this again, so struggle has been shifted out. Though they're, they're clearly directly related in every one of these struggles to what's going on. But it's almost like, well, it's, it's not really to do with us, it's something out there that's happening. How do you think that extension of war in the modern imperialist period has, has related to your analysis? Mm. I mean, I, I think there's certainly been a shift in, in this sense that uh, what, what happens, um, I think, in the, in the period from the Second World War through to, I suppose, the 1970s, 1980s, is that you get the development of a form of capitalism which I think can usefully be described as state capitalism where you get, um, you get nation states or you get, you get blocks um, of capital, where there's a high degree of state management of the economy, 
and um, that creates the context for a period of capitalist growth, capitalist development between 1948 and 1973. This is a period of boom. It's a, it's a period of boom for Western capitalism. It's a period of boom for the, uh, for the Soviet bloc. It's a period when the underdeveloped uh, world achieves a degree um, of development. I mean, it's, it's constrained in all sorts of ways, but there is a degree of development across the globe generally in that period because of the because of the boom. And then I think that begins to break down. And that creates the context for um, the kind of stability in the international order which is represented by the Cold War, where you, you, you have a you have a kind of a Western bloc and you have an Eastern bloc and you have an, an undeveloped world where they are sort of competing with each other and you have the wars that you're, that you're referring to. I think that begins to break down in the 1970s and has been breaking down um, ever since and that process of breakdown under uh, neoliberal capitalism is giving rise to new global instabilities which could see a return to warfare between major powers which we haven't really seen since the, uh, since the second world War. I mean, I think that that is a rise of growing danger. If I can make that absolutely specific, um, as long as you had um, an expanding economy and a division of the world into relatively stable economic blocks, it was relatively unlikely that there would be a major superpower confrontation. We're now in a place where the old uh, main centre of capital accumulation, the United States and the Western world more, more generally is in decline, and in very marked decline. There are other major centres of capital accumulation that are developing quickly, uh, most obviously, and I think most importantly in terms of international tensions, China. The Chinese economy is probably now about the same size as the, as the US economy. The US economy in, in 1945 represented 50% of global manufacturing production. Today it represents 20% of global manufacturing production. And what the United States is doing is it's projecting military power as a way of shoring up a position which economically is declining. Now, when the tectonic plates begin to shift in this way, you get tension, you get rising international tension. And that's why the Chinese um, are, are arming and they are, they're investing more and more of their resources in the development of their military forces because they're pushing into Central Asia, they're pushing into Africa, they're pushing into South America, they're pushing into the Middle East and so on, to grab the resources that they need to feed their growing economy and they're being resisted in doing that by the United States and, 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 and by the old Western powers. So although we've had a relatively long period where most of the killing, most of the warfare has taken place in the periphery. I think that could, the real danger in the 21st century, because of the growing instability, is that that, is that, that changes. And we actually see warfare on a much, much bigger scale because it involves a major collision between major powers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or questions or comments? Thank you, Neil. I just want to bring about uh, the parallels. We often talk about war, but uh, uh, about the recollection of the historical documentation of the periods of peace. And, and what does that teach us in terms of uh, the response in particular you know, various impairment groups and whether they fared any better uh, in periods of peace uh, in comparison to periods of conflict. And at the point, just, just thinking out broadly at the moment, that around uh, increasing in contemporary war about the, the higher involved uh, war in factions to do inverted commas the dirty work. Yeah. You know, militia men and women going out and people who have capital to be able to, uh, you know, uh, militia men and women uh, going to the highest bidder, so to speak. And I just wonder whether you've got any thoughts around how, how new contemporary ways of warfare are started to be played out. No, I, I think that's. That, that's a very perceptive observation about what seems to be going on at the moment. There is almost like a, it's almost like there's a kind of neoliberalization of warfare, just as you've got a shift away from um, forms of state capitalism where the state is a major economic player. 
to a situation where power has shifted to the big uh, corporations operating on a global scale and the state, uh, insofar as the state is an economic actor, it's now essentially trying to bribe corporations with tax breaks and subsidies and all kinds of concessions in order to get investment, inward investment. So you've got that shift of power to the big corporations. I think in the same way you can see something a little bit like that happening in relation to warfare where um, less and less is it a conventional uh, army associated with a nation state or rooted in a particular nation state, a national army if you like, that is engaging um, in warfare, though there is still that, that's still central to what is going on, but it's less that now than it used to be and you've got the rise of these proxy uh, forces um, where, and if we think, of, I mean, if we take the, the concrete example of the Middle East, one of the things that occurs to me about the Middle East is that in the crisis which has unfolded uh, there over the last decade and more, um, what you have not seen emerge inside the Middle East um, is, is the kind of uh, national liberation struggle that was, say, represented by the National Liberation Front in Vietnam in the 1960s, where you get an organisation that is, that is aiming to unite people in a struggle which is both a struggle against imperialism and also a struggle for social uh, reform. Um, what you've got are very nasty, right-wing, sectarian, divisive organisations. I mean, ISIS is an appalling kind of organisation. ISIS is as preoccupied with murdering Shia and bullying women as it is preoccupied with, with, with fighting those it's ostensibly at, at war with. Now, if that's the nature of the resistance, um, we are in a very, very bad place because there isn't actually a progressive force which is in play. That progressive force was, of course, the Arab Spring, the Arab Revolution, since they have essentially um, imploded. So I, I think you have got a kind of a sort of privatisation of warfare, a rise of proxy forces, a feeding of these proxy forces by, if you like, um, golden guns being fed in by external powers, the Western powers certainly, but other powers as well, other imperial powers like Russia, but also regional powers which are becoming players in their own right, like the Saudis and like the Iranians if we're thinking specifically of the Middle East. So the whole thing is becoming much more of a mosaic, much more uh, complex than I think it, it would have been in the Cold War um, era. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering if, um, first of all, thank you for the presentation, it was really interesting. Um, I'm just wondering if we would have to multiply the casualties or however we might refer to these numbers by a much higher number because I'm, I just thought about, you know, this discussion going on in Europe currently about refugees. People who are being de delocated because of war and the discourse as it is going on at the moment, it's not about people losing their homes because of war, but people trying to, you know, enter like the secure space and even this idea of, you know, now building a fence around Europe or, you know, like having this, this force, like this Frontex force, I, it, I mean to me it sometimes sounds like a speech of war, right? I mean Frontex sounds like, sounds like an army and it's really, uh, I'm just wondering you know, where we are heading towards because this is, actually that's a war, it's a war on refugees. And yes, I, I, I agree with that and um, <coughs> it, it, it's absolutely right to say right at the outset that uh, as, soon as, we, as soon as we begin to think about the numbers of people who are affected by war then, then um, Richard's multiplier goes up by a huge additional factor, there's no question about that and that is very much a feature, um, it's been a growing feature of war since 19. 14, and it seems that it's a feature of war that, that, is, that is growing exponentially because in Syria, for example, where I think it's estimated that about a third of a million people altogether have been killed since the civil war began, between a half and two thirds of the entire Syrian population has been displaced, either internally displaced or they are now living in exile beyond the borders of Syria. 
And that seems to be a common pattern. It seems to be replicated by what you see having happened in Afghanistan, what seems to have happened in Iraq, and so on. We see it in many of the other regional wars that have happened in Africa, for example. So that is all part of the way in which modern warfare is tearing societies apart, and it reflects the destructiveness, uh, of course, um, of the weaponry. Um, the weaponry kills people. The, the weaponry destroys minds, it destroys bodies, but what it also has a phenomenal capacity to do is to destroy uh, property, uh, to, to destroy buildings, to, to destroy communities, and to fill people with fear that if they stay, um, they're, going to, they're going to suffer. And perhaps um, making that problem worse is what we were just talking, to, talking about just now, about the the privatisation of war, the, the development of warlord militias, the development of a kind of, of, of what are basically sectarian proxy forces, where a lot of what is actually happening is, 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 a, is some form of genocide and ethnic cleansing. So all of that as part of the experience um, of warfare. Having said all that, the thing that I would absolutely stress is that we have to be clear that the, the, the basic underlying cause of all of this, of the mayhem, is imperialism. Because it's the imperial powers that are, that, that are supplying the weapons, it's the imperial powers that are pouring in the funds, it's the imperial powers that are manipulating local forces in such a way as to prevent anything progressive from developing and to feed support to those forces that will do their bidding and in doing their bidding tear these societies apart. So, of course, the, the, that, that sort of window of, um, of progressive opportunity that was represented by the Cairo Revolution, that was contested by all of the imperial powers, as well as the Arab dictators, all these forces piled in um, to crush it. And, of course, you know, for the, for the, for the, for the Egyptian military, the Egyptian military regime has effectively been restored there, you have to read U.S. imperialism, because it is funded and armed by U.S. imperialism. You have to understand that imperialist context, which is fundamental. I just wondered, how does the current debate around Europe fit in with all this? Because in a way, is it not the old stability of, of the state, because the people who founded the European Union didn't want to have another European war. And is it the forces on, on the right wing in our country who want neoliberalism? Is that part of the movement? And surely that will lead to greater insecurity in Europe? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've never bought the argument about um, the EU being about uh, uh, maintaining stability in Europe. I've always, I've always, I've always viewed it as essentially a, as a big business club. Mm. And um, it, it's, it's, it's a big business club where um, the way in which you operate and the kinds of policies, the kind of economic policies that are being pushed by the EU reflect the interests of capital. And the interests of capital, they change over time. And so now we've got an EU where privatisation, financialisation, austerity, that's completely hardwired into the way in which the EU um, is operating. So, and the, e the EU then becomes um, a source of, of instability, I mean, in two senses, I think. In the sense that the EU is promoting the tearing apart of uh, the societies that are members of the, of, the, of the EU. I mean, in relation to Greece and the other countries, the other heavily indebted countries of Southern Europe, the EU has become a mechanism for sucking wealth out of Greece and <coughs> Spain and Portugal uh, in order to feed that wealth into, into the European banks. I and mean, that's essentially what's happening. So you destroy the Greek health service um, in order to pay, to pay European, uh, European bankers. It's a source of instability in that sense. And I think it's a source of instability in this sense too, that what they want to do is they want to push deeper into Eastern Europe. They are pushing deeper into, in, into Eastern uh, Europe. With NATO, as the military cover for that process, and as they push economically into Eastern Europe, and as they push militarily into Eastern Europe to protect that growing kind of informal empire, um, if you like, that creates tensions with the other major imperial 
power in play, which is Russia. Now, I mean, I don't have any time for Putin and uh, Russian imperialism, but I completely understand that this is a conflict between two imperial powers. There's, you know, US-backed um, EU, which represents all this kind of imperialism, and there's Russia, but the Russians are, are reacting to that, and that's creating international tension. So I don't see the, the EU as any part of anything remotely progressive. Just one last quick point, please. Um, I, I came in late, I apologize for that. And, and I might actually, uh, I'm totally missing uh, the point, but I have a, a question about uh, war. What happens in a war? Whether you have one side or the other, the byproduct of war is that a lot of people die, and those that are fortunate not to die are affected, severely affected by it, either physically or mentally. So um, that that kind of rationale would actually suggest that the discussion we have in here, uh, while it is important, uh, I feel what we sh what should be happening in the world today, I mean it hasn't happened so far, is that we need to find some way of penetrating people's minds so they understand that war is a futile thing and it actually ends up with people like, like us in the world afterwards, which people don't care, you know, I mean, it's really amazing that people go to war and they fight for their country and they die for their country. Those that don't die come back. They come back disabled and then the society discards them. Many of those people have actually end up committing suicide. This story goes on, this story goes on all the time. And I mean, we just look at it on the news or we just hear it and we get on with our daily lives. And and nothing seems to be happening. And I, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe we just have to be, uh, we just have to live with it. But I feel that we should be trying to do something. I mean, I, I like the discussion about wars and who's fighting who and imperialism and all that. That's actually really, really good. But that's actually talking about uh, something that's happening that we're creating. What we have to do is try to talk about the, imp the, the consequences of it, the implications of it and what we can do to stop it and actually uh, move on to a different kind of world where, where we don't end up with, with people who are, who are broken and disabled and um, society doesn't care. I mean, these, these governments carry on. They carry on as if, you know, this is just a byproduct and we just have to live with it. Talk to the people who actually have experienced it, you know, and it's a completely different story. Thanks, thanks very much. I'd like to thank Neil very much for coming on today and a fantastic presentation. So thank, thank you. you very much. Right. Now, we'll take a, a short break. Yeah, I think if anyone wants to grab tea and coffee at the back of the room, we have a five minute to